Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delays, a couple of glitches uh, for me being a, a new user to sharing a presentation on Zoom. And i um, like to introduce you to our second of three book club presentations this season. This is our second year. And tonight we are talking about Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring. Um, I'd like to, if we can, um, include everyone, if you're willing to speak. And I was wondering if we can um, go around the screen and um, I'll sh on the next slide, I'll show you. If you could tell who you are and where you're coming from, where do you live? And then just a little something about if and when you read Silent Spring and what effect did it have on you? And um, I'll be willing to start. So uh, my name is Drina Nemes, as I said, and I only read Silent Spring for the first time starting just this past fall. And it was one of those books that I thought, oh, I should have read this. And it seemed like it was classically important and, um, but I had never gotten around to it. And then what effect did it have on me? Well, I am so pleased to have read this book because it's had many effects on me. One is that it introduced me much more to Rachel Carson, who I only knew vaguely about, and she is really a heroine to me now. And she showed through her writing the importance of evidence. She has so much evidence. And in this day and age of, of alternative facts, this was you know, rather refreshing to have all of this information. And then um, another effect is that it's such beautiful writing. There's so many um, phrases and sentences that are, are just poetic. And so it also has been somewhat um, just lovely reading and I needed to take it slow. And I've started reading it again so that I can take it in a little bit more deeply because just to pay attention just to the writing itself. So um, on my screen, um, Nancy is next and then Jean Marie and then Michelle and then Thomas. And um, that's who I have right now. Would you like to go next, Nancy, then? Sure. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, first of all, when did I read Silent Spring? I think I read Silent Spring quite a while ago. It was probably in the, uh, the 70s. Uh -huh. But, you know, I didn't read it all the way through. You know, there were certain excerpts that I read and it, it keeps coming up again and again and again, even now in literature, in books, um, because it is so it is it was instrumental and still is and i read it through thoroughly this time around i got that same copy and i've got all these little tabby things sticking out <laughs> because there's so much that is like yes 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 but it also makes me think about what effect certain chemicals are having on us today even though maybe ddt and some of the others have been supposedly banned um there's lots of other things that we have to be concerned about and I, I i just think about what what ms carson would be thinking about today with climate change and and the plastics and things like that so mm -hmm. okay um i neglected to say that i'm um from cleveland ohio basically i live in bay village now and Nancy, I think you're from Middleburg Heights right now. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jean Marie, would you like to say something about reading Silent Spring? Uh, you're muted. Uh, Jean, you're muted. I'm sorry. Can you hear Thank me you. now? Yep. Um, I said I have not read the book, but as I'm embarrassed to say that, but I am interested 
and I have heard about the book. So I thought it would be nice to, you know, listen in and, you know, hear the discussion. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Michelle. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Brocious. I am from Cleveland area as well. I am not quite finished with the book yet. I, I'm several chapters in and I do plan on finishing it. Um, but the impact that it has had or the effect it has had on me so far is, um, I, I guess, especially like the, the chapter that just went through all the insecticides uh, and how horrible <laughs> they all are. I, I guess I was just finding myself, I was as I was reading through it, I was looking up each one, making sure that it was banned. <laughs> and, and I was very thankful to find out that I think at least most of them were. Um, and also I have, a, and I don't know exactly, I have like a republished copy um, published by the, the Library of America. And it includes an introduction by Sandra Steingraber. And I don't know if all the copies include that. Um, I hope so. And I, I'm not sure exactly when the introduction was, but th this author does say that she was three years old when Silent Spring was published. So some time has passed. Um, and I was, you know, reading that first was really good because she kind of went through a lot of the progress that has been made since the book was published, all of the uh, ways this book has changed policy and law. Um, so it was really amazing to see just how this one book can affect so much change. Um, and it gives hope to any activist. Yes. So. Well, um, such a good segue. Thank you so much, Michelle. You don't know what a good segue that was. <laughs> But um, actually, I am going to jump ahead and then I'll come back. But I want to get to Sarah Steingraber. Okay, so um, I'm not, this is another edition that the Library of America just published of her three main books. But, um, and Sarah, Sandra, excuse me, was the editor. But I heard her do a presentation on, on this edition, but also she had done the Silent Spring. And it was a really wonderful um, uh, video presentation by the Library of America. And Sandra is probably, you know by now, Michelle, Sandra is also a creative writer. She's a biologist, she's an environmental uh, activist recently in jail with a broken foot. And um, she also had cancer like Rachel Carson. And being a woman in the science world, although it's different now, she could relate very well to Rachel and imagine how much more difficult it was for Rachel to be successful in her role in science way back when, before women really had a role. So Sandra is a um, kind of a, a, a leader guru on an um, advocate for Rachel Carson and for the environment. So um, when I'm going to purchase from Library of America, they are a, um, a nonprofit organization and um, their mission is, I thought I'd read their mission. Um, the proceeds from the sale of this book will be used to support the mission of Library of America, a nonprofit organization that champions the national, the nation's, nation's cultural heritage by publishing America's greatest writing in authoritative new editions and providing resources for readers to explore this rich living legacy. So these books will never go out of print, which is a, a wonderful thing about um, Library of America. Um, additionally, I, for Christmas present, I, last year I got American Birds, a literary companion 
that was published by Library of America. And it's a compilation of wonderful writings about birds. And uh, so that was my first introduction to Library of America. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Now I'm gonna go back. May so, I mention something, Drina? This is Nancy. Absolutely. Um, my edition of uh, Silent Spring has an afterword by Edward O. Wilson, E. O. Wilson. And he just passed away at the end of last year. And he was very famous for his uh, biodiversity, studying biodiversity, particularly ants, but he was just, just instrumental. And so he has an afterword in, in the edition that, again, I was reading. So uh, again, you've got, you've got lots and lots of fabulous folks that uh, have joined, you know, looked at this and just found it not just important then, but still important today. Yes. Okay, um, I see we, someone else has joined us. Um, her, um, her name is Darlene. Uh, Darlene, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Oh, and, sure. Great. Nancy, and, um, Nancy knows me. <laughs> oh, okay. We're um, also, um, the question we're first talking about is if uh, and when did you first read Silent Spring and did it have an effect upon you? Hi there. Um, so my name's Darlene Sillick. Um, I live in Powell, Ohio. I'm um, getting more and more involved with COAC, but I am president of Ohio Bluebird Society. I'm on the conservation committee for Ohio Ornithological Society. I'm a CBC compiler and a young birder advisor, and I still work full time oh. at Cardinal Health. Oh, wow. And I write grants, and I just got a grant Sunday for a project at the Wilds. I'm very, very excited about it. But yes, I have Silent Spring. I've read Silent Spring. I was um, volunteering at the zoo when they put in the aviary, and it was named after her. And the book was definitely uh, made an impact. And it's, it's, nice that they are still you know reading the book and talking about the book that says a lot for what she stood for and what she did yes definitely well you certainly are busy i i am a little busy i like it that way um i can work from home a lot i'd say half the month i can work from home so that's nice. Yeah. But okay. I, I enjoy birding. I really, really enjoy working with the teenagers uh, in birding. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ohio Young Birders, I think it's 16 or 17 years I've been with them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And then I also plan the conferences uh, for Ohio Bluebird Society. And mm -hmm. yesterday we just got our... Um, speakers up and what they're speaking about. Andy Jones is our keynote, but we're doing a virtual event and it worked well last year. So we're doing it again this year. Mm -hmm. We had one speaker who had over 941 hits to her talk. Great. So they're, they're doing a good job of, uh, we, we were doing a good job of marketing and getting people, you know, building it up and getting people excited. The, the nice thing about doing it virtually, you can have more people in attendance. You can have people viewing it when they can view it, not just tying up a Saturday. Um, I, I think there's some benefit to it, but of course there's a benefit to being in person and networking, which is yeah. what I love to do. Oh, uh-huh. Okay, thanks. Well, for Can our I next- mute myself? Let me- uh, Okay. Uh, for our next question, I'd like, uh, for those who would like to participate, if, if there's a particular chapter, section, paragraph, sentence that stood out to you and that you would like to share, um, please do. 
And um, I put on the slide here some of the titles for the chapters that I thought some of these titles were just beautifully crafted and just bring so much uh, uh, other thoughts to mind like elixirs of death. And the one that struck me very much was and no birds sing. So um, Nancy, would you, you said that your book is marked up. So would you like to share a few? Well, um, I don't know if I had a particular chapter or several chapters, but um, one of the ones is Nature Fights Back. Um, and that is, again, I think I'm looking to the bright side because so much of the book was, you know, quite disturbing and, you know, all the different pesticides and chemicals and things, but uh, talking about how uh, thing can, things can be made from um, bacteria and fungi, and you have, you have the natural biologicals that can be utilized to hopefully control some of the, some of the insects. And, you know, part of the, the concern is that we as humans continually bring in these non-native species, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. And they find a niche in our ecosystem here and then just take off like Japanese beetles. Or right now, you know, or, 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 um, what, let's see, the emerald ash borer was a, was a big problem. And now we have the uh, spotted lantern fly. And then of course, there's a lot of plants and other things. So, um, you know, finding controls natural controls that aren't going to harm the environment but can focus on one one species so I, I think that that's I think that's the, the I'm looking towards the the good parts that of how, what we can do and a lot of those things are still being used today to help control some of the some of the insect pests especially especially mm -hmm. Michelle did you have anything you'd like to talk about or share yeah, um, I uh, the the chapters that I I read I did make some notes and it was really great of Nancy to focus on something positive because I'm about to bring in something negative. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the the chapter chapter four surface waters and underground seas, um, I just I found it alarming that. Rachel Carson shared a story or an, a, an account of a certain um, plant, a chemical plant that had it somewhere in its past dumped a certain chemical and then in several years later had dumped a different chemical and all of a sudden surrounding farms that their crops were dying and it turned out that the two like the, the one chemical you know just kind of just stayed there and the other chemical added to it and in nature combined to form a very powerful and banned weed killer and that was just having effects and consequences around you know in the surrounding area um so I really hope that nowadays that plants are being managed more responsibly, that they're keeping track of what they're dumping and hopefully they're not dumping, uh, but we know they do. Um, yeah, so that was just something alarming and something that I guess I really hadn't thought of is the longevity of these chemicals and compounds in the environment and, you know, it it could happen just in nature, not even like on purpose that, you know, just dumping all these things, they can, they can form really, really nasty chemicals. I, uh, I remember that, mm -hmm. that episode and what one thing that struck me about it too, was that, you know, on, if you were testing for original chemicals, you know, you wouldn't find them. There was something new there. And if, if you weren't testing for the new thing, you would say, well, it wasn't, the chemicals weren't even there. So it, it adds to the complexity of what happens with these chemicals. Darlene, is there anything that you would like to share from the book? So 
So I didn't know, I just saw this yesterday. Okay. And I thought, oh, they're going to talk about Silent Spring. So I didn't know it was going to be a discussion like this. And it's been a long time. Um, okay. And, and I'm not even sure what chapter it would be from. But yes, the, you know, the chemicals going in the water was quite awakening. The chemicals and runoff from farms into important rivers and destroying things. At the same time I was uh, reading Silent Spring, I was also visiting Aldo Leopold's oh. um, old home. And I got to walk around there with um, his secretary, who was, um, you know, quite elderly, but it was. It was so fascinating having these two things going on at the same time. Um, so I'm not familiar with each chapter, but I just thought she was, you know, just so ahead of her time. And mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that people are still getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. It also made me more aware. And there's a woman, a professor in Pennsylvania who's done a lot of research. Um, I tried to get her to come to a Columbus Audubon meeting and talk, and uh, it was too pricey for us. And I can't think of her name right now. If somebody said it, I'd go, that's it. But she has done so much work stateside and also down in Central America on um, the problems that birds and water are all having. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have something from that chapter in No Birds Sing uh, that I thought I'd read. It's um, to me, it was just really quite beautiful. Um, so she's talking about the effects of DDT, and she's talked just recently about mammals and the effect it had on mammals. Nor is it only the creatures that forage on the ground or those who prey on them that are endangered by the foliar spraying of the elms. All of the treetop feeders, the birds that glean their insect food from the leaves have disappeared from heavily sprayed areas. Among them, those woodland sprites, the kinglets, both ruby crowned and golden crowned, the tiny gnat catchers, and many of the warblers whose migrating hordes flow through the trees in a spring, in spring, in a multicolored multi tide of life. So with the additions from other communities, the list grows and the warblers killed by the spray include those that most charm and fascinate all who are aware of them. The black and white, the yellow, the magnolia, the Cape May. The oven bird whose call throbs in Maytime woods. The black Bernian whose wings are touched with flame. The chestnut sided, the Canadian, and in the black throated green. These treetop feeders are affected either directly by eating poisoned insects or indirectly by a shortage of food. So here, I just thought her language was so beautiful about, especially warblers. And then she explains so much and it's, it, it's understandable. Okay. Well, um, I think some of you have already thought a little bit and said something already about this. Uh, this is a picture of, um, Rachel Carson in um, 1963 when she was testifying um, against the use of pesticides. And I think it's important to understand to say too that she did not say do not ever use pesticides. She and she was uh, so put down by the chemical industry, but she never said that. What she was saying is to we must test these, do research, understand what they do before we use them. And also the public should know what's happening to them before these are 
indiscriminately sprayed around them. But um, so she did testify and she seemed to re to always have kind of a, a calm presence. There are many videos of her speaking and um, if you want to pursue that further, there's a lot of information um, and you can see her in action. But would anyone like to comment on this? What do you think she would say today? Well, first, first of all, um, it, you're, you're absolutely right. And in the, the chapter that I just finished reading, um, she did support the the practice of and I'm probably going to get the terminology wrong but she did support the practice of like a selective spraying instead of a blanket spraying targeting like especially like on roadways targeting the taller plants that would get in the way of visibility and that could be done by setting the sprayer at a certain height um so she yeah, she never said don't ever use chemicals but just she just didn't want them everywhere and getting into everything um so yeah i and, and so you you trigger that memory from what i just read thank you uh definitely what she would be saying now you know i really uh, uh, hopefully she she would be pleased um about how much action has been taken on uh, as a result of her book and her testimony um a, a, as i was reading the it, um, what was it called? Chapter three, Elixirs of Death. I found myself Googling like pretty much every insecticide she mentioned and just to make sure that it was no longer being used or banned. And most of them were. There was one that wasn't, but it didn't seem hopefully to be, um, I mean, it was a poison, but it, it wasn't one of the, 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 the really, really bad ones. So hopefully she'd be pleased um, to see how much her actions have helped and benefited um, the earth. I, th but there always are new problems, as I think Nancy mentioned in her her introduction. You know, climate change. You know, that wasn't something that was an issue that was in the forefront in her day, and now it definitely is. And I just oh, would. I mean, it's it's a shame she's no longer around. I would love to have heard her speak on. The issue, like you said, Drina, she has such an eloquent way of putting things, um, and then maybe she could have had similar results to that issue as she did with the um, the chemical issue. Mm -hmm. Nancy, yeah, um, I think I had mentioned it a little earlier. Um, I bet she'd speak out forcefully against plastics. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in her day and age, you know, the, we're talking about the 40, you know, when the book was written, 40s, 50s, early 60s, plastics were not as yeah. prevalent as they are today. Um, you know, and maybe some, no, most of you look like you're way younger than I am, but we didn't have plastic wrap. We didn't have all these things that were made out of plastic. And if we did, we were like, oh, this stuff is made in wherever and we're not buying that. And it's, I mean, and just knowing that the plastics are don't break down, they just break into smaller and smaller bits and of course are getting into uh, the, the oceans and the fish and the, you know, the organisms and, you know, those seabirds are picking up plastics and feeding it to their young, which then, of course, clogs up their digestive tracts, and, and then the lot, many of the young die. So there's there's just a lot of things that that are are coming up today that I think she would really forcefully be speaking on, as we all should. You know, um, yes. I think we all should just say, you know. We, we've got to stop or we've got to slow down. Again, plastics are not bad, but, you know, the, the overuse and, you know, the, the companies forcing us to buy stuff that are wrapped in plastic or whatever. So it's out of control. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, it it is. really is. Yeah. And again, how many of you remember when Ohio had four breeding pairs of bald eagles? Yeah. This was in the early 70s. Yes. Um, and they were not producing any young because yes. of, again, the eggshell thinning. And now when you go out, 
and you're like, oh yeah, a bald eagle. I mean, we just had them down in the along the Cuyahoga River, down in the flats, like by yeah, by downtown Cleveland. We had two of them every fly time. over the Cuyahoga. I mean, they're yeah. just it's just amazing. Peregrine falcons. Yes. Um, I yeah, just so things things can improve. Mm -hmm. Darlene. So I'm not sure what else I can add. Um, like I said, I just saw this. I got an email from Western Cuyahoga and I wish I could have been a little more prepared, but I'm glad I have been able to listen to you. And it brings a lot of memories back from reading the book a long time ago. Okay. Well, um, um and can I just say, Darlene, do not even worry, and, and Jean Marie, too, don't even worry about it. We, you know, the board and with Drina, we had conversations just last week that, you know, it doesn't matter. Like people can come who haven't read the book or haven't oh, read it nice. in a long time. So, yeah, we're just here to have a discussion. And um, if there's, you know, anything you recall, that's great. If not, that's also fine. Oh, thank, thank you for saying that, Michelle. That's, that's um, you know, that is one of our aims here is to have a discussion. So how, thank often, you. <laughs> how often do you um, talk about different books? It's been quarterly. Um, our next wow. book session will be in uh, April. We had one in um, October. OK. Yeah, I've been trying to pay more attention to Western Cuyahoga. I'm impressed, Nancy. Yeah, but you've absolutely had your hands full with all the other um, things you're I, doing. I do, <laughs> I do, but I love learning. Mm -hmm. And I um, like, like I said, at the same time I was reading Silent Spring, I was very much exposed in reading Aldo Leopold. And, um, you know, they both made a real impression on me. And I've been doing many, many, many conservation projects um, for about 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I always, um, and I do, I always think, think back about what they did before technology, you know, and how they got the word out. That's great that she, I had forgotten that she was in front of, um, she was what she do. She lobbied. Um, she let's say testified. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That I'd forgotten about, but I'm I'm. You know, I love a strong woman. Yep. She yes. <laughs> and it's you know, definitely an definitely, inspiration. Yeah. Definitely. She definitely um, wasn't afraid to speak out, and you know, we need more people like that. Okay. Well, our next question is, um, if you could interview her, what would you ask her? And um, I put here the years of her date, the years that she lived. She was born in 1907. She died in 1964 of breast cancer. She was only 56. And here she's being interviewed by Eric Severide uh, in 1963 on a CBS interview. And you know, Silent Spring came out in 1962. It was a huge success. It was really extremely uh, popular. It was on the bestseller list for a long time. 500,000 copies sold right away. She, in this interview, which I was able to watch on, and I'll give you the reference in a little bit, um, Eric Severide uh, does a, this is just a, a, an amazing interview because CBS shows both sides. They start off with the chemical industry and interview um, top people in the chemical industry and in the Department of Agriculture. And he says, uh, well, we want to share, um, well, first they do Rachel Carson. And then he says, then we want to, you know, share this the other side so they do present both sides and then they have more of a discussion and eric severide is able to be 
quite firm with a chemical industry and kind of show all the evidence that Rachel put forth, that how could they refute that evidence? And uh, it's a an interview where everybody is very, not quite polite, but they're, they have a discussion and they answer questions. If, if Eric asked a question, the person would answer it. <laughs> and so it, it gave so much information so that people watching it could, you know, get a true sense of the debate. So um, the, the edition that I have been reading of Silent Spring, um, it's a 50th anniversary. Uh, and I think, Nancy, if you have this, it has E.O. Wilson as an afterword and Linda Lear, who is her biographer, uh, writes the introduction. And I sent an email to um, Linda this weekend. And I, um, I asked her if she would have an opportunity to interview Rachel Carson, what would she say? And this is what uh, she wrote back. Uh, Thanks for writing and asking a good question. I honestly don't know, have to think about it some, but I can tell you that Rachel hated interviews and reluctantly gave a few in spite of ourselves. Carson did want to raise our consciousness about the natural world, all of it, but I think she was first concerned about the oceans and what mankind was dumping in the oceans that would harm all of nature, including us. I'm glad to think that her legacy of caring for the planet lives on and that she is still considered one of our foremost role models. Trouble is, Very few people could or can write like Rachel Carson, and that's really how she made such a lasting impression. So keep reading her work. Best wishes, Linda. That was wonderful. Thank you for doing that. It was uh, fun to send it in to receive an answer and then to write back to her. You just sent it this weekend? She got back to you quickly. That's great. She, she did. Yeah. She did. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure right at this moment what I would ask her. I think I would just like to listen to her talk. But um, does anybody have a, a question that they would like to ask her? I would like to get her opinion on GMOs if she were still alive today. I don't, that wasn't around back then. Um, and I would also just like to ask her, and I don't know if she addresses, if she says anything, like I I said, I didn't quite finish the book, um, but just know what her favorite books are so that I can read them too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? is Nancy I'm not quite sure what I would what question I would ask her Uh, I think you know being an educator I probably would ask her something about you know getting um, young people uh, interested in the environment Um, how would she you know see that being done Um, that, that that just keeps running through my head you know getting getting the word out especially to young people Mm-hmm. Okay. Darlene, would you have a, a question for her if she was able to come to a COAC conference? Um, I, I think it would just be fantastic to hear her talk and then be able to ask some questions, but to... Um, I, you know, I'm like Nancy, I want to involve the youth. I want to get the youth uh, caring about the environment and caring about conservation and just everything to do with the out of doors. Um, what would I ask her? Trying to think about then and now. Um, interesting that she saw the, you know, the oceans and the water as 
being in such danger back in the 50s and 60s. I, um, I will be digging out the professor that I've told you about. She had a movie that came out um, and she had to have, if not known Rachel Carson, she had to have been akin to her because of what she's done with colleges and trying to take care of the environment. You know, you'd like to think that she, Rachel, impressed many other people who are trying to take her lead. You know, that would be interesting to know about that. I don't mm -hmm. know if your person, Drina, the, was it publisher? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, if she, if she would know something like that. The biographer, Linda Lear? Yes, 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 biographer. She definitely would. Linda Lear has uh, has a website devoted to Rachel Carson and wow. all kinds of resources and videos. There's an excellent one there that was on PBS of a few years ago. Um, there's so much there. Um, and she herself has done um, a lot of speaking. Um, hmm. Uh, she has um, been interviewed. She was on C-SPAN and she fielded so many p very politically mo motivated questions, very professionally. It was very impressive how she managed that. Um, so Linda Lear is um, L-E-A-R. And then um, also there's the Rachel Carson Council. And that's another organization that is, uh, their mission is to uh, sustain her legacy. Uh, there are so many resources. It's, it, it was very gratifying to see how much is there and how much credit she's been getting and giving, given. And you said this is the 50th year? No, that uh, was it was published in 1962. So uh, 50 years, what would be um, oh, okay. 2012, is that right? And um, yes, so now we're at 60 years, the okay. 60th anniversary. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I have a little information now that I um, gathered from someone near and dear to me, uh, my son, and he, um, is the web designer for the Roger Tory Peterson Institute. And they had a uh, exhibit on DDT last, last year. And uh, we went to Jamestown, New York, which is famous for Roger Tory Peterson being born there, but also Lucille Ball. So, and Chautauqua is there. Um, so the Roger Tory Peterson Institute had this um, exhibit. We didn't know that um, our son had put this together. We just knew that he was the web designer for the whole institute. So we were very surprised when we got there and saw this exhibit. So I've taken some information. This is an overview uh, of DDT and it's not meant to be thorough, but just a timeline that can, I think, assist us in getting a sense of where we've been and, and uh, where we are now. So here is the chemical structure and I appreciated how uh, Rachel Carson was able to do some, you know, organic chemistry teaching to us in her book on the elixir, her chapter, The Elixirs of Death. So it was discovered in uh, 1938, excuse me, it was discovered in actually in 1874 but any use as an insecticide wasn't until uh, 1938 um, by a Swiss um, scientist, Paul Muller, and he received the Nobel Prize. And I'm sorry, I have a typo there. It should be 1948. Um, I think I have my wrong edition of slides up here. So that's 1948, he got the Nobel Prize and he died, I think in 65. So he might have been aware of Rachel Carson, um, but he got the Nobel Prize, which, you know, should we be happy about that? 
Um, but it was really, um, it was a remarkable insecticide for some of its uses. Our military, the army used it extensively in World War II. Um, it was used to uh, try to get a hold of malaria. It also was used for lice and sprayed on people and it was extremely effective. Post-war um, with the United States in this you know, ramped up economic boom, um, the chemical industry took what it knew and it widely promoted um, DDT for use in the home, of course, on farming and garden use. You could get wallpaper that had DDT on its backing. Um, there are videos of showing people how they used uh, DDT. They would spray it in their house regularly. And then there are pictures showing how across um, parts of the country, DDT was just sprayed all over. Um, so um, none of the harms were really um, posted along with this, although the chemical industry did say, you know, read the fine print. Um, but the fine print didn't, wasn't really backed with research. So um, then along comes Silent Spring and Rachel Carson had been gathering so much information for many years um, about the effects of DDT. Um, Fortunately, John F. Kennedy um, listened to what Rachel Carson said and his advisors, and he uh, promoted a congressional investigation of, of pesticides, so she spoke there. Um, sadly, she died very early of breast cancer, and she never told anyone at all that she had breast cancer. And Linda Lear will say that she didn't tell anybody because she was didn't want the chemical industry to take that and use it against her and say that she was dying of breast cancer and, and now here she is being hysterical and making these claims. It's a very sad kind of story. So later on, as a result of what happened in these hearings, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, 1970, uh, first Earth Day, and at one of our book club meetings last year, uh, many of us were talking about uh, Earth Day and what we remember. I was there at the first one. Um, the Clean Air Act of 71, Clean Water Act of 72, and this is during President Nixon's um, reign, and uh, I want to promote I want to thank Mr. Nixon for that. Not anything else but that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, then in 1972, DDT use was banned in the United States. 1973, the Endangered Species Act. In 1996, um, the EPA initiates regulation of DDT under the United Nations Environmental Program. Um, in 2001, it's banned for agricultural uses at this uh, Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Now, there was some backlash um, against not using DDT, and it um, uh, Rachel Carson was vilified for promoting uh, the eagle, the American eagle, over millions of people who were dying of malaria. Uh, and again, people did not really listen to what she had said about the safe use of researched uh, chemicals. Well, um, we were at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute, so there is a connection here. Uh, Roger Torrey Peterson and Rachel Carson communicated. They did not meet in person, and I imagine that they would have if she had lived longer. Um, he was a contemporary. He was born just one year after her, 1908, and he lived a long life of 88 years till 1996. Um, he was, um, uh, as you know, uh, with him being such an important um, proponent of 
birding with his fabulous bird guides. Um, he was very fond of osprey and in his home, he moved from New York to Connecticut. He followed ospreys closely. So he did a count and, and here are his, his results. Um, in 1938, there were 200 nests in this Connecticut River estuary. Uh, in 1954, 150. By 1960, only 71. Now, in 1964, he also he went to and testified uh, against the actual use of DDT. Um, so he was politically active. Uh, as he kept on counting, in 1965, only 13 nests. In 1974, there was only one. In 75, 10. In 1976, it was listed as endangered and the Endangered Species Act had just been passed in 1973. And then in 1980, there were 19 nests. In 1983, um, the osprey was downgraded from endangered to threatened. Um, and then 1987, 35. And then you can see how over time, there has been a recovery. Um, in 1996, it was removed from any kind of listing. In 1999, um, there were 158 nests and, and just in 2020, there were 200 nests in this area. So what a comeback. Um, we talked about this early, um, this uh, addition from the Library of America. Um, with Sandra Steinbraber. If you go to Library of America, you can find their, um, their videos and St Sandra gave hers in November of last year of 2021. Something wonderful to find out is that there is a National Wildlife Refuge name for Rachel. And in 1981, I'm sorry, that's another typo. Um, she got the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Well, um, that's about it. Um, any final thoughts or anything anybody would like to say? So going back to your first, um, your first slide that you started with the different uses, mm -hmm. it would have been really interesting to have had someone tracking what happened to those people Yes. who were spraying it all around and in their homes and you know did they end up with a terrible cancer yes it would be I, very interesting that that would have been um just awestruck with that information mm -hmm. yeah well my mother passed away from um progressive supranuclear palsy. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it is connected to pesticides. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was a child, we moved into a new house and it was infested with some kind of like water bugs or roaches or something because they didn't have to disclose that back then when you bought a house. So she bought like bug killer and just sprayed it everywhere to get rid of these bugs because they couldn't afford to hire somebody to come in and do it. So, I mean, that was, you know, and then that was when she was in her thirties. And then when she was in her sixties, she developed this um, uh, prog PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, and it is connected to pesticides. Mm -hmm. So sorry to hear that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I may I add something? Um, I was uh, thinking about, you know, going into um, a garden nursery and, you know, you're looking at the plants, you're looking for native plants and you walk into the building and you're like, to me, I'm still slammed with the chemical smell of the fertilizers and the things that they still do have for sale. It just, just bothers the heck out of me. Um, and as well as the, chem, the uh, fertilizer and, and 
companies that that put the fertilizer on lawns regularly and then they put a little sign up keep your kids keep your pets off right sure um <laughs> the pets don't read thank you very much the wildlife doesn't read it, it still is is you know there's still enough out there but let me if there was a, a a chapter in the book it's called beyond the dreams of the borgias and i just kind of love the way she wrote this <laughs> If, if I have time. Yes. Um, so thoroughly has the age of poisons become established that anyone may walk into a store and without questions being asked by substances of far greater death dealing power than the medicinal drug for which we may be required to sign a poison book in the pharmacy next door. Yeah. A, a few minutes research in any supermarket is enough to alarm the most stout hearted customer provided that is, he has even a rudimentary knowledge of the chemicals present, uh, presented for his choice. If a huge skull and crossbones were suspended above the insecticide department, the customer might at least enter it with the respect normally accorded death dealing materials. But instead the display is homey and cheerful and with the pickles and olives across the aisle and the bath and laundry soaps adjoining. <laughs> I just thought it was, funny the way she, she tossed it in there that yeah you could buy that stuff and you can still buy the stuff there but it, it just there's just um you know go natural please you know, or you know plant natural things and if you have crabgrass big deal yeah mm -hmm. the ladies i have got to go but Glad I you have were very here. much enjoyed this. Now that I know what to expect, I'll be a little more um, able to speak. So glad you were here. And Jean Marie, so yes. glad you were here. Yeah, same here. I've never, you know, attended one of these, so I wasn't sure what, you know, was expected of me. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm glad to know I wasn't the only <laughs> novice. <laughs> If you can read The Feather Thief for the next book club, it's great if you haven't read it already. Okay. Nancy and Michelle, okay. thanks for your help. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Drina. Thank you. And thank you for thank everybody you, for joining. Okay. All right, thank bye -bye. you. Right, thank bye -bye. you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.